Today's our second week in Pray First series. Last week, we, we, the title was Why Pray Anyway? Why Pray Anyway? And we talked last week, just a review. You can go on cornerstonecheshire.com and catch up. But we talk about, a lot of people say, what's the, what's the story? Why do we even pray? God's gonna do what God's gonna do. Can't change God. And all that prayer does is change us. And we challenge that a little bit. And we talk about some stories about Joshua and about Moses lifting his staff and praying. We've talked about uh, God changing his mind at the intercession of Moses when Moses was praying. And you might say, well, God didn't change his mind. Well, uh, problem, who knows? But the problem is this. If he didn't pray, things would have been different. And so we can see a direct correlation how God, how God acts upon the earth based upon our prayers. There's a sovereign, ru- there's a sovereign rule of God, and he's going to do what he's going to do. But then there's the permissive will. Well, he allows some flux in there. He allows us to help shape history. And I've been amazed, as we've been reading through the Bible in the year, I constantly see people praying. God tells Abraham, he says, I want you to pray for Abimelech because what he did was wrong, and pray for him that the, the, the plague would come from his house. And so God would give people the ability to pray. And that prayer would change things. I don't know if you realize this, that God asks us to pray. It's not something you just do for yourself. It literally can help shape history. The Bible also says, I, I look for someone to stand in the gap that I don't have to not destroy the land, but I could find nobody. God is looking for people that will pray. And so prayer is one of the most important things in our arsenal. And I wanted just to kind of put it in a little bit of context because it's easy to get, sometimes as pastors and, and teachers or whatever, when you're trying to bring a concept to somebody, you tend to exaggerate it so they get it. It's not just prayer. But let me just help you understand just a little bit what prayer would be like. You cannot win a war through an air assault. You know, like for example, in a war, you have uh, the Air Force come, they drop bombs and all that, but you really can't win a war that way. You still need the ground troops to go in. But more, it sure helps to have the Air Force drop the bombs to soften the target. Then you bring the troops in. In many ways, prayer is like calling, it's like God's Air Force. It really does a spiritual, it really helps prepare the way for us. So that when we get on our ground troops and we start walking out our life, the air team, if you will, as we pray, God drops bombs on things for us and makes a way for us. It really does. I I think that's a good illustration to help us to understand it's not just an air war, it's a ground war. It's not just prayer, it's also walking it out. So, but prayer is very important. We could do no more than pray, but until we pray, there's no, I, I can't remember what that was. Okay, it was a little bit of the thing I said last week. I didn't write it down for this week. But basically, uh, you can do nothing but pray until you prayed. So I know that's confusing. I'll get it next time. All right, thank you so much for putting up with me. But today we're talking about um, prayer. The title of today's message is How to Get God to Answer Your Prayers. How to Get God to Answer Your Prayers. Today, we're gonna give you the ability to walk out of here, and whatever you want, you can ask God, he's gonna do it for you. Say, God, I want this. And you can blab it and grab it, name it, confess it, possess it. And so today, we're gonna teach you how to put God in your back pocket and get whatever you wanna get anytime you wanna get it. How many like that? Okay, I'm I'm lying to you. (laughs) There's no way that's gonna happen. But how many folks like to use God that way? I did. I do at times. Hey, God, you need to do what I want you to do. God, if you're really God, then you'll do this, this, and the other. And if you do that, I'll serve you. And so many times we look at God that way, don't we? But really, what we're talking about is not controlling God, but we're getting God to hear our prayers. We teach people all the time, go ahead and pray and you get what you want. But do you realize there are prayers that God will not hear? There are prayers that God will not hear. You can pray till you're blue in the face. He's not going to hear you. Doesn't sound very nice. I know it doesn't sound very nice. I have found, and forgive me for, actually, don't forgive me. Uh, bear with me, because I, I have found that a lot of the modern church today, and there's a temptation not to talk about the whole gospel. We talk about the good God. We talk about the God that, you know, the, the Father that will take you and get you ice cream. But we don't talk about him putting you in your room for a week. Well, we shouldn't do that. But we talk about the God that punishes you for doing the wrong thing. We talk about the sugar, Cody, you know, God, the sugar daddy God, but we don't talk about who God really is. God's a holy God. And we just go ahead and pray, and God's going to do whatever I ask him to do. No, there's some prayers that God will not answer. And sometimes some of you are praying and praying and praying, and God's going to go, no, I'm not going to do it. And there are prayers that you pray that God hears. So today we're going to look at that, and what the Bible has to say about the prayers that God actually answers. We're going to look today 
at uh, Judges chapter, um, not Judges, Joshua chapter 7. You want to get yourself ready for that one. We'll go there in a little bit. But I, I, prayer is serious business. And we tend, to, we tend to look at God two different ways. We tend to think he's either, maybe you grew up in a culture where you know, God's this uh, far distant person that is some kind of old guy uh, with flowing hair and lightning bolts in heaven. He's upset with you and you're gonna have to do this, this, and the other. He's the distant father. He's the father you can never please no matter what you do. If you come home with an A, why isn't it an A plus type of God? And he's upset with you, and if you do all these things, then maybe he'll listen to you. We have that going on, and you're scared of God. Maybe some of you went to a church where every single week the pastor spoke about hell and acted like he lived there. All right? And then you've been to some other, hey, God's my best friend. You know, whatever I want to do, whatever you do, okay, God. And we're so lackadaisical with God, we treat him like he's nothing. And we wonder why our prayers have no power. Because we take it for granted. Oh, this God, God's my best friend, and did this, and God did this, and God did that, and God told me to do this, and God told me to do that. I, I tell you, I, I'm very careful to say God told me. People to throw that around. You know the Bible says in the Ten Commandments, thou shalt not take the Lord thy God's name in. And that's doing that, by the way. Oh, God, this, God, that, you know, be careful. You know what? God's fierce. He's strong. He's powerful. He's not to be treated lightly. He's a loving God but he's powerful. You need to respect God. You need to understand that when we pray, it's a serious business. Don't just say, God, I'll do this, God, I'll do that. God holds you to what you pray. And, and this is not about scaring you. This is about telling you the truth, that prayer, God answers certain type of prayers, and other prayers he will not answer. I, I uh, remember someone praying a little while ago, not in this church, but someone asked me, a friend of mine said, will you please pray for me? I said, what? I, I need to get a new job. What's going on? Well, I'm really struggling in my job. I, I'm looking to get another company, and, uh, and I want to start probably, I, I think I got someone to help me do it, and I'm going to start. Even though I signed a non-compete clause, I don't care. I'm going to do it anyhow. I found a way out of it. I said, you think God's going to bless you? You sign a contract with a non-compete clause and you want to push that and you want to do something dishonest to find a loop. You think that's really honest? You think God's going to bless dishonesty? If you said something, you're not going to do it? Absolutely not. Or I've seen other people say, will you please pray for me? What's going on? Well, my kids are so rebellious. Uh, I don't know how to control them. They're just... They're, they're not listening to me. They're, they're, not, they're, they're very defiant in school. They're not doing their homework and doing the other and the other. And I say, well, what's going on? Well, I don't know what's going on. I said, well, the Bible says, um, confess your sins to one another and pray that God would heal you. I said, is there anything going on in your life that you may not know about? Mm, not that really. Well, I am seeing this girl or this guy right now, and I'm single, but I'm seeing them, and I guess we're kind of sleeping together just a little bit. A little bit. You know, that's not the right thing to do. Now, granted, if you don't know better, listen, we're not talking to the, those outside the church. We're talking to people inside the church. I'm going to jump ahead just for a second. I was reading again. I'm giving you a lot of advertisements about reading your Bible every day. I was reading it again today, or actually a couple days ago, Jesus, about Jesus. And I want, to, I want to jump ahead just a little bit because I think I need to, and then we'll go back. Uh, you wouldn't know that anyhow, but I'm just telling you that. It's reading about Jesus, and we, we hear so much in our church today, don't judge, don't judge, and their, their, their church judges too much, and granted, we have been very judgmental many times, but Jesus says something extraordinary, you know, follow me, Matthew uh, 7 says this, do not judge others, and you will not be judged, for you will be treated as you treat others. The standard you use in judging is the standard which will be used against you. So like, yeah, don't judge other people. But do you realize in that same chapter, chapter 7 of Matthew, he goes later on and says, Matthew, uh, he says, uh, verse 4, how can you take a speck out of your brother's eye when there's a log in your own eye? First, take the log out of yours, then go back to your brother. So there is a point in place, we're getting to this a little later on, to ask your friends, ask those who are in Christ, hey, listen, um, what you're doing is not really right, but first, take the log out of your eye. In other words, get right with God. Recognize that you are not perfect and you need God as well. And then Jesus goes on in verse 15 and says, beware of false prophets. They come disguised harmless as sheep, but are really vicious wolves. You can identify them by their fruit and by the way they act. Can you pick grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? So he talks about actually discerning fruit. You shall know them by the fruit. Wasn't that judging? No. 
when he talks about judging the beginning, he's talking about like you're God and you understand it all. And you're saying this is right, this is wrong. No, what he's saying is first get right with me. Make sure you're not, make sure when you go to that person that you've checked your own heart first. Make sure that you've made yourself, make sure you're right with God. Make sure that you've done an inventory of yourself. Then you can go to talk to somebody else with that in mind. And what do I say that for? Because there seems to be a, a really, a, people are afraid to say that something is wrong and something's right. And I will say this as well, that it's amazing to me that we in the church are really good at, at criticizing those outside the church. You know, we'll get upset at the, the boycott of Chick-fil-A. Nothing wrong with that. There's one in Wallingford. It's pretty good. Anyhow, that's beside the point. Uh, we get all upset about these other things and get upset at these different uh, these political groups and we get upset about them. They're wrong, this and the other, and Duck Dynasty and Duck Calls and all that kind of stuff. We get all upset about that and all up in arms. We criticize those outside the church. My friends, that's their job description. But we, we, we turn a blind eye to the sin among ourselves. Have you noticed that? And the Apostle Paul goes, he, he actually says, don't worry about those outside the church. You take care of the people inside the church. What does he mean by that is we need to judge within the house of God. Now, I'm going to get into the proper way to judge later on in the sermon. I don't know why I jumped ahead for it. I just feel like I need to do that. Can I blame the Holy Spirit? Okay, I'm not going to do that. Okay. But I just want to make you understand that this is not about sitting here judging people. The Bible says that we need to take care of ourselves and we need to keep an inventory of our lives. And a lot of people pray for many things and are expecting God to bless them. Now imagine this, if I, I'm going to a pastor's convention and uh, pastor's conventions, by the way, just like every other convention, I'm sorry, because they're human beings. Hey, what's your name? My name is Eric. How, how big's your church? How many are running on Sunday? And we usually tell them the Easter Sunday crowd and then I tell them that when people go to the bathroom and come back, we count them twice. You know, and, and, and you know, all that kind of thing. What's your budget? How many are running on Sunday? And it's very easy for me to start thinking, I gotta grow this church so I can go to the next pastor's convention and tell, and I'm like, wait a minute here. Is that why I'm doing this? If that's the case, I'm resigning tomorrow. No, God, it's about seeing people come to know Jesus Christ and growing up and being all that he's called us to be. And so it's very easy to get, to get the wrong motives in various things. And if I'm praying to grow the church so I can be a hot shot, and by the way, I probably could grow it a little bit more if I preached a little differently. You know, I, I guess if we talked about, you know, God's going to bless you, and every week we talk about all the good things, and there's, you do what you want, and God's going to champion your cause, and there's no such thing as sin. Never mention the word sin, and talk about how you can be a champion and all that. And I'm not going against any particular pastor or anything like that, but if that's all we talk about, and we never talk about the other side of the gospel, it could be a problem. But there is another side of the gospel. And so we're talking about that today. You can pray all you want about various things, but if you're not doing what God's called you to do, listen, uh, for those of you that have kids, if you tell little Junior, if you clean your room, then I'll let you go with Johnny. Or, or like when I was a teenager, my kids are gone, so I can say this. Um, when I was a teenager, about 18 years old, I, I bought an SS Chevelle, a fake one. Uh, it, it, was, it was an SS Chevelle. It was a Chevelle 307, but we, th we threw a 350 in it with a Polyglide two-speed. And I had these big, big, big mags in the back with... with um, with uh, traction bars, and it had, open, it had glass packs and all that, dual exhaust, and I, it had the fake SS badges, and I thought it was pretty cool, you know? And uh, I'd be playing Boston more than the feeling, and then I'd be sitting there at the light, and then I would make the, I would do a smoke offering from the Lord, <laughs> and uh, burning rubber, and I went down in front of the high school, it's a beautiful spring day, I thought it was pretty cool, I had to crank it more than the feeling. Uh, I know, I'm, I'm, I, I, need to, I need to ask God to forgive me. And I got the thing cranking, and this was before the days of subwoofers, but still it was pretty loud. And I was smoking the wheel. It took off and left 100 feet of rubber. I thought it was cool. The guys were in the back with me. And all of a sudden, I got these red lights behind me. And he pulls me over and he gives me a ticket. And I couldn't drive for the next four months and they made me sell the car. And my next car was a Toyota Starlet with 40 horsepower. <laughs> this thing was terrible. I, I mean, it, it was horrible. It couldn't go past 45, 50. But anyhow... But my parents took their privilege away because I was irresponsible. So if you and I are going to be irresponsible with how we live our lives, why is God going to listen to us if we're not doing what he's called us to do? In the natural, we do that. Now, if you, well, we're under grace, uh, not the law. No, we're not talking about your salvation. That's true. Jesus bought it all on the cross for us. You can't save yourself. You're not good enough. Neither am I. But he does ask us to do what he said to do. And if we don't do what he said, 
He won't bless us. Why? Because he doesn't want us to hurt ourselves. Too much is given, much is required. If I give you some money and you blow it, and now you're bankrupt, why would I invest more money in a company that cannot control its fiscal responsibility? Why would God bless a country that spends more than it takes in? Oh, I'm not gonna gonna get there. I just did, I'm sorry. But seriously, if you're irresponsible with something, then as a parent, then why would you give something? If you're you're investing in a stock and it keeps plummeting, why would you put more money into it? It's foolish, right? So God loves us, and he holds you accountable for what you know and what you do. So he doesn't want to hold, hold you more responsible. So since my parents could not trust me with the automobile, and if he, for example, they say, be home at 9 o'clock, and you come over at 11.30 at night, um, you, might not, you might lose the privilege to have the car anymore, and you might lose the ability to go out at night because you haven't listened. Why? Your parents are trying to teach you responsibility. Well, God's the same way in many ways, but he's a better parent. And so we just think that, God's going to just pray and no, you can pray all you want and God's not going to listen sometimes because you pray with the moral motives. And I want to encourage you with some other scriptures. That's not too encouraging. I know. I apologize. But let's continue to read a little bit. Here it says in James uh, verse four, verse three. It says, when you ask, you do not receive because you ask amiss that you may spend it on your own pleasures. So sometimes we ask things because we want it just for ourselves. And, and God has something else better, better for you. You know, I, I heard a story of a, a guy that was in Bible school, a young man was in Bible school, and he's about 18, 19 years old, and he met a young lady at the Bible school. We used to call it Central Bridal College. Uh, we call it the MRS degree. Anyhow, so you go to the Bible college, you met this young lady, he, he went back to her house to meet her parents, and he's all nervous and all that, and they're gonna, they want to get married that summer. He's, he's planning on asking uh, the father for the hand in marriage. So he, the, the father, as a good father, says, well, how are you doing, young man? Good, good. Okay, uh, what are you, uh, how are you going to provide for my daughter? Well, God will provide. Okay, how are you going to buy her a ring? Uh, well, I study real hard, I'm praying, but God was going to provide. Okay, all right. Uh, when you get out of school, uh, where are you going to live? I don't know, sir, but I know that God will provide. All right. Uh, if, if she gets pregnant, uh, how are you going to take care of the kids? Sir, I don't know how, but God will provide. Okay, all right, very well. So his wife asked him later on, she said, what, what did you learn about this guy? Well, this guy thinks I'm God. <laughs> what did I have to do with the sermon? Nothing. <laughs> but I need to give a comedic break. <laughs> we often pray these various things. We ask God to bless us and do these various things, but we often do it for the wrong motives. And God doesn't want to bless selfishness because selfishness will destroy you and hurt other people. So why would God? I remember there was a time uh, that I was praying, oh God, bring her back, oh God, bring her back. And I used to play all the Chicago songs. I don't want to live without your love. Da, 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 da. Keep on loving you. You know, Ariel Speedwagon and all this sappy journey and you know, all these songs and sitting there teary-eyed, oh, she come back. Oh God, bring her back. Oh, thank God yeah, he didn't bring her back. Whoo, man, he brought her back. I wouldn't be here right now. So thank God he didn't answer my prayer because he knew better. Uh, There's a person by the name of Ruth Graham. She said, I thank God several times over he didn't answer my prayers or I would have married Billy. That's Billy Graham. So God knows what's best for you sometimes. And, and that's why he often says no for various things. But I wanted to, to help us to look at a couple other things in scripture. And if you look at James chapter one, verse five, it says this. It says, any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God who gives it to all liberally without reproach, and it will be given to him if he does not doubt. But let him ask in faith with no doubting, for he who doubts is like a wave of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. For not let the man suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is double-minded and unstable in all his ways. So if you're going to pray about something you don't believe, don't even waste your time. That's what the Bible's saying. What do you mean? Well, if you don't really believe, why go through the exercise? Now, it's okay to do this, as the man in the Bible did. Uh, Lord, I believe, but help my unbelief. 
It's okay to tell God, God, I'm having a hard time believing that you're gonna heal Aunt Martha or my mother from cancer. I have a hard time believing that my kids are gonna come back. I have a hard time believing that I'll get in the college that I'm supposed to go into. I have a hard time believing you're gonna get me through this, this depression I'm facing right now. I don't think I'm ever gonna get out of this depression or anxiety I'm facing right now. I have a hard time believing it, but I know this, God. I know that you're faithful, and I ask that you give me the faith. I, I'm gonna give you the faith I do have, and I pray that you'd bless it, Father, and I'm gonna do whatever you ask me to do. That's different than saying, I don't believe it. Don't even waste your time. God's not impressed. But it's okay to be honest with God. You see the difference? See the difference? There's a difference between the two. And I wanted to look at prayer and fasting, Isaiah 58. We will get to Joshua 7 by, uh, by 4 o'clock today. But Isaiah 58 says the following. And he talks about fasting. They're fasting. He talks about how to fast. If you could follow along with me, uh, Isaiah 58, verse uh, 2. Yet they seek me daily, and they delight to know my ways as a nation that did righteousness and, and did for not forsake the ordinances of their God. They ask me the ordinances of justice. They take delight in approaching God. Why have we fasted, they say? And have you not seen, God, that we fasted? Have you not seen that I go to church on Sunday? Have you not seen that I give 10% and help the Girl Scouts with their cookies? In fact... Why have we fasted, they say? You have not seen. Why have we afflicted our souls and you have not taken notice? In fact, in the day of your fast, you find pleasure and exploit all your laborers. Indeed, you fast for strife and debate and to strike with the fist of wickedness. You will not fast as you do this day to make your voice heard on high. Is it a fast that I have chosen, a day for a man to afflict his soul? Is it to bow down his head like a bulrush, and to spread out sackcloth and ashes? Would you call this a fast, an acceptable day to the Lord? Is this not the fast that I have chosen? To loose the bonds of wickedness, to undo, undo the heavy burdens, to let the oppressed go free, and to break every yoke. Is it not to spare, share your bread with the hungry, and that you bring to your house the poor who are cast out, when you see the naked, that you cover him and not hide yourself from your own flesh. When your light shall break forth like the morning, your healing shall spring forth speedily and your righteousness shall go before you. The glory of the Lord shall be your rear guard and you shall call on the name of the Lord and the Lord will answer. You shall cry and he will say, here am I if you take away the yoke from your midst, the pointing of the finger and speak it wickedness. If you extend your soul to the hungry and satisfy the afflicted, then your light shall dawn in the darkness and your darkness shall be as noonday. The Lord will guide you continually and satisfy your soul in drought and strength to your bones. You shall be like a watered garden and like a spring of water whose waters do not fail. Wow, that's a lot of scripture. Yeah, we like to read scripture in church. But you know what that's all about? That's about God's not impressed with all the religious shenanigans that we can do. He's not impressed that you're fasting. He's not impressed if we're not helping the poor. And this I've been asking God, God, what can we do to help the poor and the afflicted? Well, we do help them to a certain degree, but we want to do more, God. Do we just want to give turkeys out at Thanksgiving and give some canned goods at a food drive? What can we actually do to help people? God, well, let's not just think of our own wealth and our own thing. How can we help those that are afflicted? How can we help those who are being mistreated? My friends, that's the kind of fast that God wants. He's not interested in us just trying to do spiritual exercises. And so God said, I'm not going to hear a thing you're going to do. Well, God, I come to church and I tithe, I do this, I do that. You need to move on my behalf. No, he doesn't. What kind of fast is he looking for? A people that are going to just reach out. You know, the Bible says in James 5, it says, confess your trespasses to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Elijah was a man just like our nature. He prayed earnestly that it would not rain. It did not rain on the land for six years, for three years, excuse me, and six months. I'm so glad the Bible's real. It talks about Elijah. Elijah was a man just like us. Do you know Elijah suffered depression? Yet he was a man that prayed and God held back the rain uh, three years and six months. Amazing. He says he's a man just like us. But the, what does the Bible say? It says the following in James. It says, 
The prayers of a righteous man. It means doing the right thing. Not talking about your salvation, but God's not going to hear you if you're not doing what he's asked you to do. Does that make sense? I mean, come on. We, we do this all the time. You give someone a pay raise when they perform, when they do what you ask them to do. You, you reward your children when they, when they obey. Right? So why would not God? Why is that wrong if God does that? No, not at all. It says, confess your trespasses to one another that you may be healed. I remember praying for someone one time that had a bad back and really bad back, and I just felt like I needed to ask him. I said, you have any unforgiveness towards anyone? Well, yeah, yeah. What happened with my ex-husband? What? He's it's unforgivable what he did. I said, well, there's no sense in me praying for your back because God's not going to heal it. Now, meanwhile, if someone comes to church, does not know God, and they got drunk the night before, and uh, they got in a fist fight with someone, they sweared some, they cursed someone out on the way to church, and they come forward and they ask God to heal their back, God will probably heal their back. <laughs> but if someone who knows better, who's a believer, has unforgiveness like that, that's going to blockade God's blessings in your life. Why? Because God takes the word seriously. That's judgmental. No, it's the word of God. It's the word of God. And I want to mention another major point is this. Answered prayer is influenced by our community. It really is. Turn to Joshua 7, if you could, please. I love answered prayer. God answers prayer. I've seen God do amazing things. You know the amazing thing is I find about prayer? Have you noticed how we tend to forget the good things that God has done? And we tend to remember the bad stuff? I don't know if it's just me or not. But when I sometimes get like, man, God, you haven't done anything in a while. I go back and I recount the things he's done in my life, the life of this church, and the life of my family. I'm like, wow, God, you've done a lot for me. God does answer his prayers, and he loves to answer his prayer. He loves to answer prayer. He does. He loves to give his children good gifts. But there was a situation in Joshua, and this is, this is not going to be very politically correct. I'm sorry, so just bear with me. Joshua 7. What happened was Israel, uh, Moses passed away. God took him, and now Joshua was in charge. They crossed the Jordan River, and they went to a city called Jericho. It was a city that was fortified very heavily, and miraculously, God wiped the people out. He made the walls go down. He said, I want you to wipe out the city. Take no spoils for yourself at all. Everything is given to me, nothing for yourself. So that's what he did, and God gave him victory. And then next thing you know, there's a city called Ai, Ai, that's up a little bit, and uh, they said, well, let's take that next. He, said, he says, okay, let's send a couple of spies up. Oh, it's nothing, Joshua. Take two or 3,000 men. We got this thing in our back pocket. No big deal. So that's what they do. Let's go ahead and read now what took place. Verse 1 of chapter 7 of Joshua. But the children of Israel committed a trespass regarding the curse, accursed things for Achan, the son of Carmi, the son of Zabdi, the son of Zerah, of the tribe of Judah, took the accursed things. So the anger of the Lord burned against the children of Israel. It almost reminds me of being in school, and we all fail the test because someone cheated. Now, that's not fair. But do you realize that uh, the American way is not necessarily God's way? I don't know if you realize this. But we often think of ourselves individualistically. We often think of ourselves in silos. But what I do affects nobody else. No, it's not true. What you do affects somebody else. And here's a vivid example of a man named Achan who took the accursed things. Well, that's what the Bible has to say about the story. So, verse 2, Joshua sent men in Jericho. I told you that already. Let's go to verse 6. So they basically got, they got, they fled. 36 people died when they chased them. And Joshua, verse 6. Then Joshua, when he heard the report, tore his clothes and fell to the earth on his face before the Ark of the Covenant, which was the presence of God until evening, he and the elders of Israel, and they put dust on their heads. That's what they used to do back in those days. When you used to pray, you get some dust and get sackcloth. What's sackcloth? Like putting on a wool sweater without a T-shirt. It's nasty, okay? Makes you itch, makes you feel uncomfortable. You do this to make yourself uncomfortable and show God you mean business. You don't have to do that, by the way, but that's what they used to do in those days. So Joshua tore his clothes, fell on the earth, on his face before the Ark of the Covenant until evening. He and the elders of Israel, and they put dust on their heads. And Joshua said, I'll ask, Lord God, why have you brought this people over the Jordan to deliver us into the hand of the Amorites to destroy us? Oh, that we would have been content to dwell on the other side of the Jordan. Oh, Lord, what shall we say when Israel turns us back before its enemies? For the Canaanites and the inhabitants of the land will hear it and surround us and cut off our name from the earth, then what will you do for your great name? Listen to the Lord here in verse 10. So the Lord said to Joshua, get up. 
Why do you lie on your face? Israel has sinned. Wait a minute. I thought Achan sinned. No, Israel has sinned. What is, we'll continue to read here. I don't get that. It doesn't seem fair to me. I don't like this. So let's just ignore this passage of Scripture and talk about how God wants to bless us. No, let's continue to read what it says. So the Lord said, get up. Why do you lie on your face? Israel has sinned, and they have transgressed my covenant, which I commanded them. For they have even taken some of the accursed things. They have both stolen and deceived, and they have also put it among their own stuff. Therefore, the children of Israel could not stand before their enemies, but turned their backs before their enemies, because they have become doomed to destruction. Neither will I be with you anymore unless you destroy the accursed from among you. Get up, sanctify the people. Say, sanctify yourself tomorrow because this is the Lord says of God. There is an accursed thing in your midst. O Israel, you cannot stand before your enemies until you take away the accursed thing from among you. In the morning, therefore, you shall be brought according to your tribes. And he goes on and on. And what happens? They find it's Achan. And they have to rid Achan. He loses his whole family and everything. That sounds terrible. I don't like the Old Testament. It sounds like ISIS. I, under, I get that. I understand that. I don't have time today. It'd be great to do some um, uh, study about why this stuff took place. But the bottom line is this. There was sin in the camp, and God would not honor them. Could it be? Could it be? The reason we don't see the power of God displayed in our church today to change culture is because we have sin in our camp. Could it be? that we turn the blind eye to sin that's going on in your life because we don't want to lose your tithe? Could it be that uh, this is happening? Yes, it could be. You know what? We are our brother's keeper, and we should watch out for each other. When you do something that affects me, when I do something that affects you, sin hurts. Sin destroys our witness. God's a loving God. He's not going to give us more responsibility and more power if we're, going to, if we're not going to listen to him. And we are responsible for each other. I, I, just, I shared with you before, uh, that's why I did it before, so when I read these passages of Scripture, you would get it a little bit. It, Jesus says, do not judge lest you be judged. He says that in chapter 7 of Matthew. But then he goes on to say, take the log out of your own eye, right? Humble yourself, then go to the person and speak to the person about this various thing. And you shall know them by their fruit. So we are to look out for each other. And the Apostle Paul says something in 1 Corinthians. says, um, have I written to you in my letter? 1 Corinthians 5, 9 to 13. Have I written to you in my letter not to associate with the sexual immoral? But now I'm writing you that you must not associate with anyone who calls himself a brother, but is sexually immoral or greedy. We like to pick on the sex thing, but not about being greedy. All right? An idolater, in other words, worship something else rather than God. A slanderer, a drunkard or swindler. With such men, do not even eat. And I love this. I absolutely love what the Apostle Paul says here. What business is it of mine to judge those outside the church? It seems that all the church wants to do is judge people outside the church and ignore their sin in their own lives. Right? Do we not do that? Turn a blind eye. I've done it in the past. And I realize, you know, I can't be doing that anymore. Because if, if, if God wants to use Cornerstone in 2015, he wants to use a people that's pure. So if you come to this church, if you're sinning, we're going to tell you about it. But we're going to do it in a humble way, realizing if not for the grace of God, we would fall. But sin destroys. It takes away power from your lives. It makes the church irrelevant. You might as well join a country club. They have better facilities. And they have, more, they have cooler people and more wealthy people and better connections for your businesses. So go to a country club if that's what you want. It's not church. is not a country club. It's not a place to find friends and influence people. It's a place to find who you are in God and help each other grow strong. It's a family. So if we're going to play games... And uh, I won't, I won't, I'm not gonna, I don't ask and I won't tell. And you won't ask and you won't tell. Hey, brother, how you doing? That's well, doing well. You think it's okay to, to cheat and lie? You think it's okay not uh, to receive income and not report it? You think it's okay to sleep with your girlfriend or your boyfriend when you're not married? It's just a piece of paper. Well, so is the Constitution. And so is toilet paper for that matter. <laughs> Sorry, that was crude. 
Mom, I apologize. <laughs> Just a piece of paper. Yeah. So is the Magna Carta. And so is the deed of your house or car. It matters to God. And so I think in 2015, it might be a good idea to stop getting angry and yelling at the TV set about all those people out there doing things wrong and look at ourselves and say, God, is there any stuff in me? Now, if I'm driving a car, which I tend to do, <clears throat> and I'm driving my car and the, and the dashboard light goes off and there's a picture of a gas pump on there and it's orange. I'm like, you know, this car is so flipping judgmental. What right do you have to put that stupid light? I'm going to drive this car whether you like it or not. Guess what's going to happen to me? I'm going to call AAA, which I've done in the past, and they have to give me a couple gallons of gas so I can get gas down the street. Because I don't want to listen to the dashboard light. My friends, we should be that way for each other. We should tell each other, hey, listen, I'm concerned about you. I see the way you talk to your spouse. I see how you cut them down. I see how you treat your kids. I see how that you're living with your boyfriend, and, and, and you're acting like you're married and you're not, and you're praying for God to bless your kids. How can he bless you? Now, if you don't know better, that's okay. But if you know better... There's a way to do things. I'm not better than you. You're not better than me. But God loves us. He designed us. He knows what works and what doesn't work. Having a relationship with no commitment is not work. God loves us so much that he wants the best for us. He's not angry with us. He loves you. He wants the best for you. He doesn't want to see you playing in the street when there's fast cars going by. He doesn't want you driving 80 miles an hour in an ice storm. That's judgmental. No, he loves you. He loves our church. And I think God wants to empower Cornerstone. But he's not going to empower us if we allow sin to run rampant around us. You can lift your hands and you can cry. And, he loves me. And, and even get a big lighter and do like you did in the 80s. I'm sorry. Or the cell phone thing and, you know, get all emotional and, oh, I felt, I felt convicted today. And go back and do your own thing. That doesn't impress God. Why not we take it seriously and say, God, I want to get right with you. Lord, I don't want anything to hinder our prayers. Why not be a place where people come to this church they don't mess with God? Because Ananias and Sapphira in the book of Acts, they lied to the Holy Spirit and they dropped dead. And what does the Bible says? Not many associated with the church, but they had great fear and respect for them. How about we stop criticizing the world and look at ourselves and get right with God? Now, if you're coming to church today and you're not a believer, don't worry. <laughs> get right with God, okay? I'm telling you that. We're not here to tell you you're doing it wrong. We're here to tell you get right with God. But for those that are in the church, if you're counting yourself a believer, you don't have the right to say, I'm going to do what I want to do. It's my life. No, you don't. It's not your life. If you're a Christian and you think it's your life, you're not a Christian. You follow the philosophy of Christianity, but you're not a Christian. Well, who are you to tell me what I can do? I'm not anybody. The Bible says it, not me. Listen, I'd rather talk about peace, love, and happiness. And I'd rather tell you about how to get rich in three easy ways and, and God will bless you. I, I, I like to talk about that and how to have a happy marriage and, and how to make more money and how to be peaceful and happy. That's, I, I, if it was up to me, I'd talk about that, but I can't do that because it'd be malpractice. God loves us. He's tired of the sin. It destroys us. It destroys our generation. It makes the church puny and weak. Why not get serious with God? Don't say you love God if you're going to do it your own way. Don't say you love God if you want to slander people. Every time you talk to someone, did you hear about such and such a person? Da -da 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 -da. They say, you know what? I don't know if you realize this, but you're gossiping, you're slandering somebody. Stop picking on all the sexual sins. We like to do that, don't we? But what about slander? What about getting greedy? What about being a backbiter? What about being a swindler? Listen, all of us need help. All of us are a wreck. I don't, it, by the way, all of us are screwed up. I don't know if you realize that. I got issues. You got issues. We all got issues. We got issues that require tissues. I copyrighted that. Don't you dare use it. We all have issues. Listen to this. Now, this sounds like almost, it almost sounds contradictory. Let's cut each other some slack and let's tighten up how we care about each other. What do you mean by that? It means I got problems, you got problems. God does not have any problems. Let's try to complete each other instead of compete against each other. 
Let's try to help each other become what God's called us to become. And when we talk about sin, we're not enjoying, oh, did you hear what Jack is doing? <laughs> no. Did you hear? Don't say that we hear what Jack is doing. Why don't you go to Jack so Jack knows Jack and tell Jack that what Jack is doing is wrong. Jack, I care about you, man. What you're doing, you're hurting yourself. Now, if you're coming here today and say, why would I want to be a Christian and have that? Because something inside of you is bothering you right now because you know it's the truth. You feel it right here, don't you? Because God loves you. There's a way for a man and woman and a family to be. There's a way for a people to be. It's not about their pointing the finger at everyone else. It's about saying, God, here am I. Change me. We're supposed to be each other's keeper. But we should do it with humility and grace. And we should correct each other like we want to be corrected. In that same passage of Scripture that we're reading through. By the way, guys, can I ask you a favor? Can you start reading the Bible? Is it all right if I ask you that? If you think you're going to grow in Christ without reading the Bible, you're kidding yourself. If you think you can go through and be a strong Christian and not read the Bible, you're kidding yourself. If you think you can become something of God and not pray, you're kidding yourself. Now, we're not talking about legalism. We're talking about relationship. I don't know about you, but I want to grow. I'm not interested in a country club. Well, I'm doing a lousy job of it if that's what we're doing because I, I can't even compete. Let's be a place that changes lives. Let's be a place that, that goes after God. Let's be a place that's serious about who we are in God and who we are with each other. We need God. And when I ask you to read your Bible, I'm not asking you to do something bad. I'm saying, hey, you want to be healthy, eat. A lot of us are anorexic. If I could put, if I put spiritual glasses on you my, right now, and imagine our spirits are represented in our bodies. And imagine I looked across this congregation right now and you guys look like you're in, in prison camp. You're all skin and bones. And you're anorexic. You do not eat. And you're walking around. You're cold. You're shivering. You feel weak. The reason why is you're not eating. This is not in my sermon, but I need to say it. Because you're not eating. Now, would that be hateful or judgmental? No. We want to get that person help. If someone is there anorexic or bulimic, we want to help them out because they're starving themselves. Many of you in the spirit are anorexic. You're skinny. And God wants you to grow. He wants you to be strong. The only way, listen, the Bible is amazing. There's no book in the world that will do what the Bible will do. I sit there and I read it and it cuts me. It blesses me. It speaks to me. It's amazing. Every day I get into it and it touches me. Who cares about signs and wonders? Who cares about social action? If you don't have God, I'm not interested in it. We need God. It comes in His Word. Get in the Word. I don't know what to read. Okay. Start with the New Testament. We have, listen, we're going to buy Bibles. If we, if we need to give them away, we'll get buy more. Get in the New Testament. Read a version you understand. New Living Translation is easy to understand. It's not bad. Read it. Pray. Lord, open my eyes. Read it. Read it 10 minutes. Get a pen. Underline it. And pray over it. Get in the Word every single day. Once you for the next seven days. When we do, okay. Instead of asking you to do it for the whole year, let's do it for seven days. Let me ask you for seven days to get up every morning, 25 minutes earlier than you normally get up. I'm going to ask you to get up earlier than that and start with, uh, start with Matthew. Can't go wrong with Matthew. It's my son's name. Okay? So start with Matthew and just read about five to ten minutes. Actually, start with the book of John. It gets, gets faster into the action. <laughs> okay. And just read and underline and then pray and say, God, will you change me? God, I see this. I want you to touch me. Just do that. And then I want to encourage you to pray what you read about. Say, Father, I pray that you'd help me today, that I would treat others like I want to be treated. Father, that I would hold no bitterness toward anybody else. I, I, I can show you my journal every day. I mean, stuff, I, I get stuff all the time. I'm like, God, can I use this on Sunday? This is good stuff. He says, all right, I says, it's okay. <laughs> I want to encourage you guys. Take, just take this week, this seven days, give it a shot. And why don't you start praying?
Start praying and praying the right prayers. And let's get rid of the nonsense in our lives. Let's get rid of the junk in our lives. And let's start caring about each other. You know, I'd be, you know, I can go on and on. I'm not going to. I said enough. Let's all stand if we could. I don't know. I don't want to play church. Do you guys? Come on, seriously. Do you guys really want to play church? God help us. Really, seriously. Who wants to play church? I mean, it's, I'd rather go see a movie. It, it, a lot better than the church. If that's what we're here for. Entertainment. It's not about entertainment. It's about change and become more like what Christ has called us to become. Well, let's pray. Father, we're sick of playing church. We're not interested in judging the world and thinking we're better than someone else. Lord, the truth of the matter is we're a wreck. Truth of the matter, we got stuff in our own lives. Truth of the matter is we're looking at things we shouldn't be looking at. We're speaking and saying things about other people we shouldn't be saying. Lord, we're cheating. We're dishonest. We're prideful. We're arrogant. And yet we're still saints. Lord, I ask you to forgive us of our sins, Lord. We confess that we have got stuff in our lives that's not really very good. And Lord, we want to be a people that when we pray, you hear us. Lord, we want to be the people you've designed us to be. We want to turn away from the things that we know are wrong. We want to say yes to you. We want to say yes to your Holy Spirit. We want to say yes, God. You are our master. You are our commander of our lives. And I'm going to ask some of you today, you've been coming to church and you, you, you're doing whatever you want to do and you say you're a Christian. No, you're not. Let me say it again. If you th think you can do whatever you want to do and still be a Christian, you're not a Christian. Let me say it again. If you think you can do whatever you want to do and still be a Christian, you're wrong. You're not a Christian. You, you like the philosophy of Christianity, but you're not a Christian. A Christian is a person that gives his life to Jesus Christ and says, I am no longer in charge. He's in charge. And whatever he says, I'm going to do. If you're not at that point this morning, you're not a Christian, stop deceiving yourselves. I'm just going to pray a prayer right now. If you will pray this prayer with your heart, we can start a new day together. Lord Jesus, I thank you for dying on the cross for me. I can't save myself, but you saved me. I thank you that you take away all of my sins. I ask you to forgive me of all of my sins, both non, known and unknown. I give up my desire for control. I declare today, my life is not my own. You are boss. You are God. And I choose to listen to what you say. I turn away from my flesh. I turn away from saying it's my life. It's not my life. I declare my life is your life. I ask you to fill me with your Holy Spirit and I choose to walk the way you have me to walk with your help in Jesus' name. Amen. Let me ask you right now this morning, how many prayed that and mean it for the first time? Let me see some hands. Come on, let's be bold here. Come on. Let's be bold. Come on. Why don't you guys come up? Let's come up. Come on. Let's be serious about God. Come on. Let's be serious about God. Come on up. I don't want to play, do you? Come on. Anyone else? Let's be honest here this morning. You, you like Christianity, but you haven't surrendered your life. You're still the boss. And you say, you know what? I prayed a prayer. Come on down. I'm going to ask you to sing that song, Jesus. Come on. The Bible says, if you honor me, if you acknowledge me for a man, I will acknowledge you for the Father. Let's get serious about God today. Jesus, how can it be He loves me? He is for me. Jesus, He loves me. He loves me. He is for me. the prayer team to make their way up. We want to pray with you. We're not better than anyone here. We just want to say, we've been through the process. We've given our lives to Christ. We want to help you do it. We're going to open these uh, altars. If you need to go, we understand. 
But we're gonna ask you to leave quietly. We're gonna just ask the music to be played. We're gonna leave this open right now. If you wanna get right with God, it's an opportunity for right now. Don't wait. Don't wait because don't let the cement dry. If you made a decision and now it's time to set it right, set it right now. Come down and we'll pray with you. And let's believe God for the best. Amen? God bless you.